We are recording. Should we just start? Yes. Hi, um, hi everyone. Thanks so far for all the really great presentations and my discussion. I was meant to plan this presentation more than I did, but then I was listening to everyone speak, so this may not be as good as it could have been. So <clears throat> what I'm going to do in this hopefully relatively brief talk is go through a little bit of what the brief <coughs> I've been given, which is to talk about this idea of third world Marxism. So I'll talk a little bit about what it is what it might mean, and I'll say a little bit why I hate methods and never want to <laughs> talk about them. Um, so look, the first, yeah, there you go. That's why I don't like methods. <laughs> so I just wanted to start off a little bit by <clears throat> less sophisticatedly problematizing some of the methods talk that we've already had happen, right? So I'm always really skeptical about the implication of the idea of method, as it seems to have really proliferated in recent times in tandem with really stupid research council funded um, you know, <laughs> scholarships, where suddenly like you've got to write your method in a little box to explain what it is. And method is almost always convoked against some idea of theory as, as them being different. Mm -hmm. And very frequently what that feels like is, is it, it's an attempt to kind of depoliticize scholarship in some way. Theory is in some sense understood as enmeshed with po politics, with political struggle and with those kind of insights. Method is the more scientific thing which describes in these kind of like more universal terms what you're going to do in this particular way. And as I say partly, I feel like there's a very vulgar explanation for this which is just that someone somewhere in a funding body realized that empirical studies which do need methods are the real mm -hmm. stuff and what we then have to do is like conform to that kind of thing but also as i say because i feel like often the invocation of the language of method is a kind of attempt at depoliticization or a way of removing the kind of intellectual insights from the kind of broader political and other contexts in which they've been articulated. So I don't know how much I'm gonna talk about method here, also because half the time I'm like, I don't really know what method is or means, um, but we'll get a sense I think throughout of how at least I think the kind of theoretical choices and political choices that we make can inform our intellectual work and our, our kind of our, our politics. <laughs> Um, so the first thing I wanted to just mention them was this idea of third world Marxism. I can't remember now if I chose it or if it was chosen for me, but I think in some ways it's a, like a, a, a useful, but a, a certain, in certain ways also relatively problematic term, which can stand in as a placeholder for other things, right? So some of the problem of this, of course, is that the third world generally refers to a specific historical political project, right? And it's the project in the kind of during the Cold War of an independent, sort of independent third world bloc. And that bloc had very different politics from it. Like third worldism involved particularly radical politics aligned to the Marxist tradition, but it also involved very conservative politics aligned to essentially having a status quo that included like brown people a little bit more, right? But it is it's important to say that the third world always had a sustained relationship <coughs> with the Marxist tradition. Now, another problem I have, in a sense, with, with some of the language of, of third world Marxism is it's like, well, does this mean Marxists who were in the third world? Or does it mean a specific kind of Marxist theorizing, which we might then associate with the third world? I say that because like the third world has been filled with some of the most like plodding, vulgar Marxists imaginable. But and, and you know, the European world has been filled with creative Marxists who reflected on anti-imperialism in particular <laughs> ways. So I think when we're thinking about this, maybe it's most useful to think of this as a kind of broader family of theoretical and political interventions in Marxism. And in particular, as a Marxism rooted in traditions of anti-racism, I think also anti-imperialism, and specifically, as Fanon put it, like a kind of stretched Marxism, which, um, as people have seen from the readings that I've assigned, um, is a kind of <laughs> term I think that is particularly useful. A side note on the readings, I didn't consciously assign only my own stuff. <laughs> and I thought other people would assign only their own stuff. And then I opened up the book and I was like, oh, I look a psychotic narcissist. But like, I'm like only half a narcissist. So anyway, we have this idea, right, of these kind of different types of tradition within Marxism. And I think, you know, we can call them stretch Marxist, we can call them anti-racist. And I want to talk through a little bit about what that means and how we might distinguish that from other traditions of Marxism and other attempts to invoke ideas of, let's say, anti-racism and anti-imperialism 
and what that cashes out for us as intellectually. So, you know, this is the kind of quite famous quote, like from Franz Fanon, where Fanon is talking about what he understands as the specific situation in the colonial context. And what he says here, right, is, well, actually, if you look in the context of like the of the colonies, race seems to assume this incredibly significant like role where it doesn't look like it's a kind of traditional class position, which is kind of assigning you wealth, value, etc., but rather a kind of racialized role, right? And we know this because, of course, like the, col the colonial project, insofar as it involved people, like white people entering into like racialized places, that whiteness became a kind of source of, of value and social position. And so Fernand says, well, we need to think about this. Like, and this involves a slight stretching of the Marxist tradition when we're dealing with the colonial problem. No, it's the term slight stretching. It's kind of important there for Fanon. So another kind of idea of this that I find very useful and a kind of way of like recomposing this is Amy Cesar's like resignation letter to the French Communist Party and to Maurice Ferrez. And he says, look, I'm leaving the French Communist Party, but this doesn't mean that I'm giving up on Marxism or communism. What I'm giving up on is the idea that communism places black peoples at its service and not vice versa. And that indeed what we need to think through and theorize is a Marxism which is put at the service of racialized people and racialized populations and not the other way around. And he goes on to kind of invoke Chinese communism and various other African communisms as kind of examples of this. So loosely thinking, I think if we start then to think through what this might mean, <laughs> we could roughly approximate that something like a third world Marxism or a stretched Marxism is one which invokes in some sense like the subject position of people who exist in these contexts and gives us specific Marxist insights into the particular realities that they face. So it's a Marxism which is non-schematically understanding the way in which the world is like constructed and divided and attempting to think that through on a Marxist basis. So what might that look like and why might that be useful? So this is like to me what was and is a very important quote. Like if you wanted to go through my exceptionally boring biography, this quote played a really important role in me deciding that I became a Marxist. Because when I was like, I think how old, I was like, when I was 17, I was reading this and I was like, oh, oh, I really understand things now. Right. And in this quote, Marx says in, in talking about and trying to understand the nature of capital, he goes, and this, by the way, is a kind of, we can call this a uh, remonstration against kind of new materialism and all these other things that come along. He says, well, the thing is that capital is raw materials, it's instruments of labor, it's means of production, it's means of subsistence, it's stuff. But that stuff isn't what makes it capital. What makes it capital is its role in social relations and in its role in producing like capitalist processes of exploitation, right? And he illustrates this with a comparison with slavery where he says, well, what is a Negro slave, a man of the black race? It explains nothing. A Negro is a Negro. Only under certain definite conditions does he become slave, a slave. And so this idea from Marx is that we understand kind of capital and the kind of phenomena of the world, not by their kind of thingitude, but their, their set of existence in a definite set of material conditions, in sets of social relations. And this is incredibly helpful. And I think for me, it was incredibly powerful in helping to formulate my understanding of what the Marxist tradition could explain about the world. But of course, and this is like on further reflection for me, there's a weird thing here because Marx thinks that capital is a produced in definite social relations. He thinks that slavery is produced in definite social relations. That's good. He doesn't think that black people are naturally slaves, but he does think a Negro is a Negro. And he does think that only, on only certain conditions he can become a slave. So Marx in this quote, doing very good work, is also treating race as a kind of naturalized and natural phenomenon and not rooting race in the very set of social relations that he has said has already happened. So on the one hand, he is saying there is nothing natural about the enslavement of black people. But on the other hand, and I think in a quite contradictory way, despite his insistence on definite social relations producing kind of social phenomena, he doesn't do that to race. Instead, he treats race as a kind of natural, pre-existing, pre-given thing, which we would know on a very brief glance of history, that cannot be true. A Negro is not a Negro. A Negro is a Negro in very, very definite certain sets of conditions. And outside of those conditions, it's a person who has a, a, a certain kind of skin pigmentation. And indeed, at crucial historical moments, people who were black 
did not think of themselves as black. They had plenty of other identifiers to be going on with. And it was only upon contact with, you know, <coughs> white people, and specifically, as Fanon says, white people who are there to be masters and not others, that someone becomes a Negro. So for me, the idea then of thinking through stretched Marxism is to go, OK, so what if we were consistent with Marx here? What if instead of saying a Negro is a Negro, only certain definite conditions as you become a slave, we said, what is a Negro? A Negro is a person with certain kind of skin pigmentation. Only under certain definite conditions does he become a Negro, and that is intimately interlinked with the idea of his enslavement. So in this sense, when we're thinking about this idea of what I would call stretch Marxism, what you call third world Marxism, <laughs> it is to say, well, what does it mean to apply these kind of Marxist insights to the specificities of the world in that context? And how does that happen? Now, I think we can think about the distinctiveness of this position in relation to what we might think of as two distinct responses to this kind of quote and this kind of problem. So the first right, and what we can rail against, is a certain kind of vulgar Marxism. And I think this vulgar Marxism is composed of a number of assumptions, which we're going to problematize throughout. And those assumptions help to kind of explain the problems with a kind of supposedly traditional Marxist account. So the first of those is this idea that capitalism is an economic phenomenon. Capitalism is specifically economic. Now, my has already started to problematize that because simply by talking about social reproduction, we already problematize the idea of capitalism as being an economic phenomenon. And as I'll say a little bit later, actually, when you read Marx, as many of you will know, he's not really interested in capitalism as an economic phenomenon because Marx, again, only thinks it's in certain definite historical conditions that you can think of something as being economic. Anyway, Marx is interested instead in how it is that societies reproduce themselves socially as a totality. And in capitalism, that takes the specific form of an economy separated from the rest of social life. But that is, by the way. So the first thing is this idea of capitalism as an economic phenomenon and race and the phenomena around it as epiphenomenons, which are ultimately unimportant to the real driving logic of the economy, grinding on and on and on and on. So that's one thing. The other thing which very frequently appears in this context is people who think of capitalism as primarily like a national or domestic phenomenon, right? And this is the idea that, well, the model that Marx has in mind is a kind of closed domestic economy. And this is often coupled with a kind of account of capitalism in which it happens in Europe, it diffuses out of Europe. And what you get is it's just a spreading of a European set of social relations to the rest of the world. So in this kind of account, right, the advanced capitalist world will sit at the center because everything else is just some varying degree of differentiation to that. So this is a very kind of, let's call, vulgar Marxist account, which treats both race and imperialism as both epiphenomenal and also secondary to what else is going on. So against that, we can say another response to Marxist thing is what I'm calling idealist trash. And this is the thing which takes seriously the centrality of race and empire and imperialism, but also thinks that these are somewhat free-floating and freestanding. And I would argue, actually, that's been a very common response to a kind of presumed position of the problems of the kind of traditional Marxist approach. This centers those kind of like, centers those phenomena as proceeding in some way economic questions. And often we'll focus on kind of epistemology, rooting things in like psychic and cultural positions. Notice often both of these accounts, by the way, there's a common idea of the kind of reified sphere of the economy or the economic as being a thing that's three fluid, one to criticize it, one to embrace it. And there's also a common sense in some respects of, um, of, of, of race as being in some sense like timeless and prior to questions of social mm -hmm. relations, right? So against those kind of positions, which are not perfectly instantiated, but I think do capture things that go on in the world, we can think of like stretched Marxism as this way of like having it all. And how do we have it all? Well, the way that we have it all <laughs> is by understanding both the centrality of kind of, we'll say for short, shorthand, race and imperialism, but understand that as a material question with materiality understood not as meaning like the economy, but instead concern with the ways in which human beings reproduce and produce their own social existence mm -hmm. over and over again. Which means understanding these phenomenon as themselves social relation, which are both central to capitalism as a totality, but also in some sense then 
are part and parcel of the logic of the capitalism exists and reproduces itself. So if we then like return to this Fanon point, for instance, wow, this is a sticky keyboard. Um, we could say, wow, that was many more back than I thought it was, like my apologies for this. Um, so Fanon says the originality of the colonial context is the economic reality and difference never comes to masters and realities, right? So the question we would ask is, well, what are the conditions in which this happens? The Marxist question is not, it's the economy. The Marxist approach is to say, in what conditions do things take these particular social forms in these particular kind of ways? So in this sense, right? Okay, we can say that there are then two central elements which we can use to start thinking through what it means to take this kind of approach, and that these elements can be approached in very distinctive and specific ways. The first of these is the question of imperialism. You can sometimes say colonialism and empire. We can get into a discussion about how those things interrelate uh, in the Q&A, and questions of race, racism, and racialization. And it's my argument, essentially, that when we're thinking about these questions, taking distinctive approaches to these these issues in a in particular Marxist way yields important insights for our kind of intellectual work. So the first of these then is obviously like the question of imperialism and colonialism. And again, I'm sure people are like, oh, I know this world, but alas, this is what I'm going to be telling you. So maybe you'll get something useful out of it. But crucially, right, what Marxists have always done and have always sought to do is understand imperialism in light of capitalism's like social relations. It's very important actually to note that like Marxists were at the forefront of creating the, the word imperialism as a term that had political salience and political importance. And if you look at the kind of history of the emergence and the centrality of imperialism to a bunch of political discourses, it's tied very closely to the Marxist tradition. It's the same thing with colonialism, by the way. Now, it's important, right, that if we, so how do we get to this idea of like the relationship between capitalism, imperialism, and colonialism? Well, obviously, if you just read Marx as, you know, you'll be well advised to do and have already done and read beyond volume one of capital you can see right that the international continue figures in marx's understanding of the way in which capitalism functions primitive accumulation is a, is a significantly international phenomenon and marx understands always in his writing how to situate kind of domestic capitalism we'll get into that in this kind of international context marx thinks that the creation of a world market is of decisive importance now, beyond Marx, right, the features that Marx identified in capitalism have formed the basis for Marxists to think about the kind of ubiquity and nature of imperialism and colonialism. And these, to run through them very quickly, but we can get into them, are obviously capitalism is, is a system that involves a ceaseless drive for accumulation. Right? Capitalism is constantly reaching out into the world and trying to accumulate, and individual capitalists are trying to accumulate more capital. Now, what Marx demonstrates to us, and what I think is like one of his most brilliant insights, is that this is a necessary character of capitalism. This isn't because capitalists are greedy or mean or horrible. This is because in a system in which anyone can outcompete you at any moment and therefore bankrupt you, you have to, in advance of anything else, be expanding in order to accumulate more and more and more. So capitalism is driven by this iron law, as Luxembourg talks about it, of competition in which you are constantly forced to accumulate capital just simply for the sake of the possibility that someone else might out accumulate you. So capitalism always has this drive. The second point is that capitalism is also crisis prone. Because of the nature of capitalism on a whole bunch of levels, it's anarchic, like search for profit, the tendency of the rate of profit to fall, the kind of mismatch between making stuff and it being bought. Capitalism is constantly, constantly on the verge of a crisis and you never know when that crisis is gonna happen. And of course, in order to resolve those contradictions, capitalism expands outwards. That's what it does. It always, because often the way to resolve a contradiction, and again, we can talk about that in the discussion, is to go outwards, accumulate more. But capital accumulation is also always uneven, right? And that's because like capital accumulates more capital, can we accumulate more capital, can outcompete other capitalists. So we know this, that Marx is pretty clear that capitalism is constantly accumulating wealth at <coughs> one pole and misery at the other. So what this means is that capitalism is a process of continual expansion and transformation because capitalism in order to create, create to create profit needs to create capitalism and so it's constantly remaking social relations for profit and all of this is driven I think this is very important 
as a competitive process between different capitals. The capitalism is not, there's not a magical thing called capital which comes out into the world and does stuff. This is about competition between different capitals and their relationship to their states in particular ways. So there's this constant drive to expand and transform in order to seek value. But this is a drive which is differentiated because of the uneven con concentrations of capital and combined with the state, right? So this is the crucial thing to say, which is like Marxists have always theorized imperialism in this particular way. Now, a couple of things I think flow from this, which are important for our understanding of imperialism, and particularly from this kind of more like stretch Marxist or like third worldist position. The first is that it's actually really necessary to foreground questions of value in imperialism. Some people want to reduce imperialism to geopolitical competition, to war, to power, and it is those things. But Marxists understand this crucially as linked to the seek for, the, the seek for, that doesn't make any sense, the search for and the expansion in the search of creating new and more sources of value. That also means that Marxists, especially from as a third world Marxists, have understood that imperialism involves the movement of value. Part and parcel of the way in which this uneven kind of development works is that value will move from different social locations to other social locations. Why is that important? I think it's important because a crucial corollary of this particular variant of understanding imperialism is that imperialism isn't just an added extra that just happens. There's not a real European domestic capital which is advanced and it does a bit of imperialism. Every capitalist, every capitalist state is necessarily implicated in a global economy and a global division of labor. So this, 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 so when you said like Federici is writing about Europe, that's right. But Federici is writing about Europe as if you can write about Europe and you can't write about Europe because there is no Europe without the rest of the world. Like the central insight of, of Marxist understandings of imperialism is that this is you can't understand a domestic capitalism without understanding an international division of labor because that simply doesn't exist. So in some sense, we could say this following Buharin, right? There's not a domestic and an international sphere. There's a global capitalist totality or economy, which is differentiated on the, on the basis of the way in which value moves and in contrast and stuff like this. Now, a crucial aspect of like, again, this thinking is that, as we said, this is not an economic phenomenon. This is a phenomenon of social relation and social transformation. So this is necessarily undergirded by a vast system of other social relations which are involved in this transformation and upholding all of this, in forms and like, practices of social reproduction, in forms and practices of labor, of institutions, all of this stuff is part and parcel of that very process of the expanded accumulation of capital. So rather than just think about imperialism as war or competition or this added extra, we have to understand instead, imperialism is central to the existence of all contemporary capitalism. And that means that you can't be like, well, I'm just gonna look at this but not that bit, because those bits are always and already implicated in a global market in this kind of way. So that's the kind of stretch Marxist version of imperialism. What then about this idea of race, racism and racialization? <laughs> well, as we've already alluded to, right, the core insight, I think, in this sense is that race is a social relation. Race is not a thing which exists freestanding in the world and, you know, automatically we get sorted into. Race is, is a thing which is or a process which exists through creating groups of people who can then be subject to forms of you know, dispossession, hierarchization, discrimination, et cetera. So in this sense, the kind of classic insight from this bit of the tradition has been, race is a, producer, race is a product of racism, <clears throat> not the other way around. It's not the case that you have race as this pre-existing difference and you go, yeah, I just naturally really don't like people who have a different color skin to me. Instead, the fixation on particular differences and the creation of them as being significant is part and parcel of the process of racism to begin with, right? And that's crucial because there is a tendency or a problem sometimes to think about racism and race simply is about difference. But we actually have to inquire, well, in what conditions does difference take on a systemic and important role? In what sense does it start structuring our social experience? And in what conditions does it become this idea of being inserted into a hierarchy? What are those conditions? Well, as we have just said, right? These are all the things that capitalism does. And the crucial point is what capitalism does is it expands unevenly and has to transform people's existence and societies in this kind of way. That is almost by definition already going to be a racialized process because the process of social transformation, of justification of difference, of mobilization of difference is and has historically taken the form of race 
and racism. Now, this is especially true because capitalism is also a kind of system structured on the idea of abstraction. The kind of core thing that capitalism does is it's a machine of abstraction. Why is that? Because it's organized around the value form which necessarily has to abstract everything. Capitalism is all about taking things which seem non-commensurate, making them commensurate, and comparing them to each other. And in capitalism's forms of expansion, those abstractions take on particular roles. And race is one of those abstractions. Race is bound up very closely with the abstraction of value. Race involves reducing everyone to some kind of datum and then comparing them and inserting them into a hierarchy in this kind of way. And in this sense, right, race is one of the forms of appearance that these processes of capitalist social relations and expansion take, right? Racialization is a process through which capitalism comes into the world, structures it, and justifies itself. Now, as a form of appearance of capitalist social relations, right, this also means that race is, again, not this added extra to capitalist social relations. Instead, <laughs> as a form of appearance, it is totally central to the constitution, maintenance, and justification of capitalist social relations. If you go and look back at the processes of, like, the expansion of capitalism, you simply cannot say, like, well, here was the race bit and here was the economics bit. No, those things were always bound up together in particular ways. And indeed, if you go and look at the forms that racialization tended to take historically, they were closely linked with ideas about the inability of people to manage economic affairs, about their irrationality, which were all linked to capitalism as a mode of being and a way of existence. And in this sense, right, what we can see when we structure the changing forms of capitalist accumulation, when we structure the differences that go on in capitalism, modes of racialization change with them. And part of the task then of this kind of account is to understand the kind of embeddedness of racial processes within these processes of like social transformation, map them out and understand what that means for both the continuing nature of, of, of capitalism and racism. So what about law? I'm gonna do more law than you did. I'm gonna do a whole slide. Um, <laughs> obviously, right? There are some people in this room who don't like Pashikanis because they're wrong, but that means that there are disputes <laughs> about the relationship between law, law and capitalism. I continue to believe that essentially capitalism, like Patrick Carlos remains the most convincing figure of mapping out what the relationship between the, like the legal form and juridical forms are and capitalism and specifically of commodity exchange. And it's worth saying commodity exchange, right? Because commodity exchange precedes capitalism. Like often people are like, oh, but you think law is only capitalist? But no, I think that the world has had extensive forms of commodity exchange that weren't capitalism, but that capitalism rep represents a particular form of intensity and subsumption of the commodity form in such a way that it is a qualitative as well as quantitative transformation. And that is the point at which law becomes much more abstract, much more important, much more distinct, and much more domination right? And what we know, if, again, if we look at these historical processes that we've described and contemporary processes of the link between capitalist accumulation, imperialism, and racialization, law is there at every moment, giving everyone a smile and a wave. Law is structuring these processes. It's often structuring processes of racialization. It's structuring processes of dispossession and expansion. So law remains crucial to understanding these processes. And for our purposes, these processes are absolutely vital in understanding what law does. And crucially, right, that's not just international law, because if we're thinking about this imbrication of the domestic and the international in capitalism, that means you can't be like, well, at the international level, it does this, and domestically it does, no. Again, these are different scales or modes of the organization of these social relations, but they are not qualitatively distinct, and therefore the patterns and things we're matching are kind of there too. So, here are just some rough then kind of ways in which we think about the law as intervening in these kind of processes. And we can think that through what we've just said before. So we often think of law's relationship to class struggle, but of course we shouldn't simply say class struggle because capitalism does not just involve class struggle, it involves struggles between rival capitalists, it involves capitalist competition, struggles between rival capitalist powers. And it also, crucially because of this international division of labor, involves very complicated and weird class formations which can't be straightforwardly mapped onto like the older two or maybe three class model, but rather class gets structured by the movement of value internationally, hence the labor aristocracy thesis, right? So law is in some sense articulating and being articulated in these moments in that way. And understanding that in the light of what we just said before is important. We also have this idea of ideology, right? And ideology I think is particularly important, because of course I think that I'm a Marxist, but like it's important 
both in terms of thinking about how law presents the world to us, and therefore how that implicates questions of race and racism, but also I think in thinking about like, there's a, there's a kind of great Terry Gilson line about ideology, about ideology not being what's in your head, it's how you act as if something was in your head. So I thought this about like the visibility of the, like the, 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 the kind of hidden abode. Mm -hmm. People might rationally know that. They don't act as if it's something that is like public in the same kind of way, right? Like if we think about people's actual responses to attempts to in, intervene in some way into that space, people are like, no, you, you, you won't be doing that. You can't be doing that. So even if people on some rational level can be aware of something, they still act as if it is in that way. Like law still like, mediates that division in important ways which help people act as if and obviously right this material interrelationship between law capitalism racialization bears out on all of these questions we have to think about how that plays out in that kind of way so that then is a kind of map if you like of what i would think would be some insights that we can take from this kind of way of thinking about like of, of the relationship between law, capitalism, imperialism, race and racialization under this broad rubric of like stretched Marxism. Now, I wanna conclude very briefly by doing like a slightly counterintuitive thing, but I think might be helpful for us to then get back to some of these questions that, that people might have about method stuff. So Rafif Ziada, whose t-shirt you're wearing and who you also mentioned, me and Rafif have had conversations about this. And one of the things that we sometimes say is like, well, actually how stretched is this Marxism? Because actually, is this not just a Marxism which is attending more accurately to the material conditions in which it finds itself? So this is just a quote from Lenin, where Lenin very famous is, well, the, the, the gist, the living soul of Marxism is a concrete analysis of a concrete situation. So in some sense, is this an act of stretching or is this an act of saying in the concrete conditions in which we find ourselves, which are the conditions of a global imperialism with people having specific subject positions, is this in fact not the living soul of just Marxism to core. And in this way, when we think about these different elements together, <laughs> is this instead, follow Lukas talking about orthodoxy, not just a sophisticated example of us thinking the, the social totality through properly, to think about the forms in which capitalist social relations appear and are reinforced, and therefore as a totalizing analysis. So perhaps rather than us thinking about this as being like stretched versus orthodox or stretched versus traditional, we can think of this as instantiating the kind of historical promise and mission of the Marxist tradition in a particular way. So in this sense, right, we can think of like our understanding this way as approaching what we exist as a global social totality in which necessarily issues of racism and imperialism are central structuring elements. And we need to think about how those central structuring elements sit situate with move and are moved by changing patterns of capitalist social relations. And crucially, this involves moving away from a vulgar materialist understanding in which there's an economic sphere separate from everything else, and instead understand that the social, to the social totality of capitalism is a social totality in which society has to reproduce itself, and it does so through the specific social form of the search for profit and its attendant things, with that social form giving particular shape to those social relations in this way. And this is the kind of approach that we take to structure our research by understanding that situation, unpacking how those things are related together and thinking that through in this light. And I'm done. Can we, uh...